Hi, I'm Lena Roald. And I'm Carlton Coffrin. And in this video on convex relaxations for power system optimization, we're going to be covering solution methods for ACOPF style of problems. So there are kind of two core ideas for how you can solve generic nonlinear optimization problems. You can take the uh, problem in its natural form uh, and try to solve it directly, and that presents a number of challenges. So the algorithms uh, have different properties. They can be unreli unreliable or not scalable. Um, but the good news is that if they converge, uh, they will give you a uh, feasible solution to your original problem. So Colin, what does it mean when you say that the algorithm is unreliable? It would mean that uh, if a solution exists to your problem, it may not find it. OK. So no guarantee that you will get the right solution. I see. Um, the other approach to solving these types of problems would be to approximate the equations you're trying to solve, say from nonlinear equations to linear equations, um, and then use numerically stable, fast, and scalable algorithms for linear equations. Um, but the difficult point here is that there's no clear connection to the original problem you want to solve unless you, you know, provide a proof that the accuracy of your linear um, approximation is so good and you can bound it. Uh, it would require some work to kind of connect it back to the original. Okay, so in this case, if there exists a solution, you would find it but you don't know if the solution you find is going to be feasible for your original problem. Definitely that can happen. Um, it can also be the case that your original problem has a solution, but by linearizing you eliminate it. And so actually your linear approximation will say there's no solution, but in your original nonlinear problem there is one. Okay, so it can go both ways. It can. Um, so let's look at nonlinear programming, optimization methods. You know, what is the basic ideas here? One of the most popular one are so-called interior point methods. These are very similar to newton raphson which you probably studied in calculus. So um, let's say we have a non-convex optimization problem, which is defined by this gray blob. And we want to kind of find a solution which is going towards the top of the slide as high as possible. That roughly how these uh, algorithms will work is you'll have a starting point for your optimization problem, and then you'll go in the direction of the objective until you hit one of these constraints, and you'll follow along the boundary of the constraint until you get to one of these points where kind of wiggling around in any direction will not improve your solution anymore. And these are called local optima because you've kind of fallen into a well where in any direction you go, um, you won't improve the objective function. Now, um, it's important to note that these type of methods can be very fast, but they kind of have limited quality in the guarantees they provide you. So they only guarantee that you find a locally optimal solution, and if, you if they get an infeasible uh, point, they only guarantee local infeasibility. So it's not a proof that your whole problem is infeasible. So um, an example of how that kind of infeasibility case can happen is imagine that these curvy constraints actually extended outside of this gray region and you started the problem here. It may follow the objective function until it hits one of those constraints and then follow the constraint exactly and get stuck in a little wedge which is outside of the feasible region. It never actually found the interior before it, it got stuck in an infeasible point. And so this kind of can cause, a, this type of situation can cause the resolver to report an infeasible problem when in fact there's lots of useful feasible solutions out there. And um, if you're interested for the optimal power flow problem in a study of where this type of conditions happen, both local infeasibility and local optimality, there's a very nice transactions paper that studies this in great detail. The next um, big idea in nonlinear programming solution methods is the idea of global optimization. And the whole approach here is really to mitigate this issue of local um, optimality guarantees. And the most, there are many ideas in global optimization. We will not be doing a comprehensive survey, but the most co um, common one is this idea of spatial branching. So what you'll do is you'll take the entire space that your variables can um, 
be in, and you'll break it up into a number of little boxes. And then in each side, in each of these boxes, you'll solve one of these local optimization problems. And um, the guarantee here is if you have enough small boxes, one of them will find you this well of the global optimum solution. Now, one of the big challenges with these kind of methods is that they can be very slow, and scaling them up to, say, a realistic power network sizes can be very difficult. So that brings us to the second major approach to solve nonlinear optimization problems. And that is to use linear approximations. Yay. Yay. And uh, so one very common linear approximation in, for, for the AC power flow uh, problem is to use a DC power flow approximation, which is essentially a, one possible linear approximation of the power flow constraints. So the DC power flow in particular uh, is sort of based on a number of assumptions that are often relatively good assumptions for practical power system operation. So starting from the um, power flow constraint on a line as you see it here, we can also write it down in the polar form of those constraints. If we take those constraints, which are still the full AC power flow constraints, we can add a number of assumptions. So for example, a typical assumption is that the voltage magnitudes are going to be close to nominal, so they are close to one. And also we have that the angle differences are going to be small, so they are kind of close to zero. And this allows us to get rid of uh, all the voltage magnitudes, so we just substitute them with one. So we don't care about voltage magnitudes and we are not going to care about um, any voltage magnitude constraints either because we just assume they're going to be close to nominal. And then we can also, um, for, for, the, for the cosines, uh, we will essentially just get that they are going to be close to one again. Uh, and for the sine functions, we can approximate them just by the angle difference itself, because this is how it works when you have small angles in there. Um, and given that, we have those expressions for active power and um, a reactive power. In addition to this, we assume that the we have essentially a lossless system or that the resistance of our, trans of our power lines is much smaller than the reactance, which uh, which is the same as saying that the conductance is very small relative to the subceptance. So you are just going to assume that we have a lossless system and that uh, these G uh, parameters here can be well approximated by zero. And if we do that, actually the, you can tell that the reactive power uh, flow constraint here just kind of cancels itself out, so it becomes zero. And the only thing that is left over is this um, function for the active power flow on a line. So it's um, essentially the negative susceptance times this um, angle difference. So when the angle differences here, or when the angles here, the voltage angles are variables in our problems, problem, um, we now have a constraint which is linear in those variables. So this is a linear approximation, which is very commonly used. So um, to kind of let's now look a little bit of the properties of such a linear approximation. So if you think about this gray um, jellyfish over here being the AC power flow uh, feasible region, a DC um, power flow region might look more like this box because it's defined by these linear constraints. And what is important to note here is that this linear approximation may be overly optimistic. So we, m we are including some, or we may be including at least, some um, points to in this feasible region that were not in the original, op um, were not in the original feasible set, and that may be better points. So if we were trying to go like upwards on this slide, we might end in this corner of the DC approximation, which was not part of the original AC feasible space. Uh, in addition, there might be some feasible points uh, that are not included in DC approximation. Uh, so you see here there are some part of this gray region that are outside of the orange one. And in particular, the DC uh, approximation or any linear approximation may also not include the original optimal solution. So if we're trying to kind of go upwards and kind of slightly toward the left, we might have our um, optimal solution, our true optimal solution, be the um, on this gray region, which is not covered by the DC approximation. 
So really what is important here is that we cannot assume any level of accuracy unless we are able to prove it mathematically, um, for which is possible maybe for some very specific linearizations. Um, however, there's a large variety of linear approximations out there, which is linked to the fact that linear problem optimization problems are very easy to solve. Um, some other popular linear approximations beyond the DC approximations are such as the Taylor expansion, the LP um, approximation of the AC power flow problem, or the or approximating the sign but including the losses. So these are some uh, varieties. Um, so how are we then now using those linear approximations? Because clearly we need to be a bit careful when we are using them. So maybe the most useful uh, used approach is just to solve the problem using a linear approximation and just hope that the solution is accurate enough. And actually in many cases it is really good. Um, another possibility is to use the linear approximation as a starting point for a non-convex AC optimal power flow problem. And an important practical example of this is when we are using the DC optimal power flow for um, market clearing problems, which is typically done in the United States. So all power system uh, markets uh, that are you know, uh, liberalized are typically cleared using this DC power flow approximation. And then the solution that comes out of this market clearing is then fed into an AC optimal power flow problem, which is used to make sure that the solution that we have is actually going to be secure to use in operation and it's not going to violate any of the bounds that we need to observe when, when we have practical operations. Another use of the linear approximations is to fix some decision variables um, before we solve a non-convex AC optimal power flow problem. So for example, you could imagine solving a unit commitment problem where you include a linear uh, approximation of the AC power flow constraints just to fix the decisions on generation on and off constraints and other integer variables. Um, which you can then take those decisions um, and then include them, fix them, before you solve the non-convex AC OPF. So that is kind of a typical flow here. You would have sort of a base case network uh, file, which you would feel, feed into one of those approximate solvers based on the linear approximations. And then you would take the solution, you would use a f exact solver for which take into account the full AC optimal power flow constraint, which will give you an AC feasible solution. Great. So to recap, what we've covered in this lecture is that we've discussed that uh, computation of non-convex optimization problems is hard in general, but in practice, some of these local methods like newton raphson can be effective. Um, when they're not, sometimes people turn to global optimization. Um, and another popular approach to kind of addressing non-convex optimization is um, to do linear approximations of your original nonlinear problem. So what comes next in our um, series here is that we want to really start looking at kind of the core of this um, series of presentations um, by looking at another method for addressing non-convex optimization problems, namely using convex relaxations. Um, and that is what we are going to develop next. And we are also going to provide, so we are trying going to try and provide you with some in intuition for how it is possible to develop such convex relaxations for the AC optimal power flow problem. Um, and yeah, essentially how is this done? Great.